Welcome to Search Talk Live with search engine optimization and marketing experts, Robert O'Haver and Matt Weber. Powered by the Robert Palmer family of companies. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Search Talk Live. We've been out a week. We had the hurricane we went through. Matt, you survived that? Yeah, man. It's great Honestly. to be back. Great to have electricity and great to be able to take a hot shower. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would imagine. I didn't lose power, but I got a tree on the house. Oh, you so. should not say that out loud. You really <laughs> should not. And, uh, you know, we got to have our thoughts with everybody who's still without power, which there are many people still without power here, not only in Central Florida, where the Search Talk Live corporate headquarters are, but yeah. uh, throughout the state. Yeah, it's quite crazy. Well, those of you that are tuning in for the first time, Search Talk Live is a digital marketing podcast. We talk about really everything, search, uh, SEO, uh, rankings. We talk about uh paid search, social media, content marketing. We really cover it all. And also with us, this is the first time we've done this, but we have three guests today. Michelle Stenson Ross is with us. Michelle. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey, welcome. Glad you uh, were all three here so we can really kind of have a, like a round table of discussion here, which yeah, is nice. And today we're taking the topic in an interesting area because, yeah. uh, you know, you and I get a lot of feedback about the show. And there are folks here that are uh, not only a part of listening that are part of big shops, uh, but they're also, we have a fair amount of uh, kind of one man shops that listen to the show. They try to get some of the best practice advice. And we've got a guest today is going to help us talk about how to grow your agency or grow your shop and get bigger on mm -hmm. that, which is fantastic. So our guest today is Hike Sakin, and he's one of the co-founders of a fascinating and very successful shop uh, called it Logic Inbound, which I love the name. And so I'm really excited to take that topic and talk about how do you grow business today? Because we're always talking about how to help SEOs and digital marketers grow their clients' business. Today, it's about growing your own business. Amen. <laughs> Hike, how you doing? I'm good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're glad to have you on. So, I mean, I kind of want to get into it. And, and uh, before we get started, I wanted you to tell us about yourself and a little bit about your background and what you do and all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. So I would say that my background is actually more from a development perspective than a business owner perspective. Mm -hmm. I started, you know, making robots and writing apps right around 2009, 2008 when uh, Android first came out. I made one of the earliest apps on the App Store and uh, celebrity quotes for different celebrities. And we gathered about half a million downloads at that point. Now, I was just starting college at that time, so I didn't know anything about running a business. But mm -hmm. I saw, hey, we got a lot of downloads. Um, and all those people on TV with millions of downloads, they're loaded, right? <laughs> Fortunately, I was a little naive, um, and, and that venture didn't work out. But yeah. um, that sort of got my hunger going, and I started my path on entrepreneurship. Uh, my next company was a CRM startup. We went to TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco. We pitched our company. Um, I want a tablet there, but <laughs> that company didn't end up going anywhere. We had no idea how to sell to businesses. Mm. So we took a step back and we, you know, me and my partners, we looked at our network and we said, you know, let's just talk to all the business owners we know, figure out what their problems are and try to get them to pay us. Because what I learned working on apps is at that time, you only got paid on advertising. There was no in-app purchases. And yeah. so compared to businesses that are willing to pay you for value, um, trying to entertain fickle audiences seemed a lot tougher and harder to crack. So we went into uh, a recruiting company at that point, specialized in the real estate niche. I was focused on the back end and operations. I built out a CRM uh, tracking system for Craigslist ads and a whole bunch of other software. That was sort of our first foray into marketing and business. Nice. I learned a lot of different tactics like AdWords and conversion rate optimization, building up our own infrastructure. And eventually, one of our good friends asked us for ideas. He was a manager uh, at a local business and he said, hey, I see you guys are growing your business. Can you give me some ideas for improving our marketing? They ended up being our first client after we gave them a list of 10 key ideas that they could do to their business to improve you know, their search ranking, their branding, all their different marketing aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, and they actually hired us to be their first marketing client. That's when our agency started about two or three years ago. Nice. So it was out of a need of someone you knew. Huh? Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, the key theme that I found is always, you know, just keeping in touch with your network, being, being willing to give. 
um, because from there what happened, he be, they became our flagship client. We used them and you know their other marketing partners to get our second and third clients. Um, you know, we used that client to talk to other partners um, and found a more broader marketing agency. At the time, we were just doing AdWords and some A-B testing. I didn't really, really have any idea about SEO, but we found an SEO partner who we wanted to work with on this project. Mm -hmm. uh, and he ended up being our co-founder at Logic Inbound. Nice. Um, so from there, we this would be about um, early, late 2014, early 2015. Um, I guess going into 2016, you know, we grew our agency from just the three of us to now we're up to about six employees locally and we've got, you know, dozens or so people overseas. Um, we're growing pretty strong and, and like that number you mentioned, yeah, we got to about 100K in yearly revenue in, in year one um, after starting the new company together. That's impressive. Congratulations. You know, one of the things you said, Hike, was that you uh, you didn't know how to sell to businesses, but given your growth rate, it sounds like you figured something out. What is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that you know it took a lot of it took all those failures up front to figure out how to sell to businesses. So my first B two B company was a real estate recruiting company. So what ended up happening was is we had to sell to real estate agents and people that ran real estate offices. Now I don't I don't know if you've ever tried to sell to salespeople. But if you if you've been through that ringer, then selling to a normal business person is like a walk in the park, because you get all the objections. Like they know your stick, they know that you're trying to call them to sell them something. You know, they try to pull one over on you. So I think that's the kind of the battle. That's kind of the battle plan if you want to build up your um, sales background. Try selling to the worst audience possible, and then when you move into an easier, you know, I would say an easier field like search engine optimization where any business owner can benefit from your work, um, it's much more simple. You know, you can sort of pick and choose your clients. If someone's a problem, you know, move on to the guy next door that does the same thing. In real estate, one of the problems we ran into was, you know, there was a couple different franchises in a region and those were our clients. So we had to figure out the sale. It wasn't really, there wasn't really a lot of options. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can relate there because I do a lot with real estate agents. Um, and, uh, definitely understand that. What is your philosophy now on growing the agency and what is your outbound or inbound effort to generate leads for yourself? Mm -hmm. I think the single biggest thing that helped us at all stages of the company was partnerships. So early on, um, the, the founding of the company was based on a partnership between, uh, our, me and my initial partner who's more on the sales side, me on the implementation side, we were doing AdWords and we partnered with one of our friends who did an SEO company. He, he had the problem of not being able to fulfill all the business he was getting. He, he couldn't really scale it. And what we were looking for is a product that we could sell more easily to businesses because what we were running into was that with AdWords, we needed to drive pretty significant budgets in order to produce clear and measurable results. Yeah. Versus with SEO, we could offer a product, we could offer a service for just a few thousand and produce even more significant results. I see. And what did you do to, to drive those clients? I mean, because I mean, you, you just said that you had so much work that you couldn't keep up. So, I mean, yeah. So, so for example, in this case, the person we partnered with, he was ranking on Google uh, number one for Seattle SEO and all the variations of it. Yeah. So he was already getting a ton of inbound leads. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we grew our client inbound lead list by going to networking events, specifically ones called, uh, example would be BNI. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Yes. Basically, networking events where the purpose of the event is specifically sending each other referrals. So there's a lot of other networking events out there. Like there's ones for people that want to get a job. You know, there's big corporations that sponsor networking events. Um, things like that. But my recommendation would be if you're really starting out, you're looking for for more business, you should try to avoid anything that's not strictly about, you know, this is about referrals. This is about growing your business. These are all business owners in the room. Um, until you're ready to hire, you should avoid all the other events, really. Well, it looks like you've got a really active uh, meetup group that you participate in, if I've uh, mm -hmm. followed it correctly. And it looks like you've used that meetup group for kind of lead generation can you tell us a little bit more about that? And are you using that for lead generation? 
Mm -hmm. So one of our strategies is to become sort of thought leaders in our local industry in Seattle. So we, we have a few different meetup groups. One of our largest ones is called Co-Founders Connect. And the main premise with the meetup groups, and there's a common thread to this with everything we do, is mainly to give, um, give first and then ask later. So what that means is we want to throw an event that attracts the best high quality people. And then once the people show up, we can talk to them, see what kind of value we can give them. And then down the road, talk about having a business relationship. So for example, you know, if we throw an event for co-founders and maybe someone's a developer that goes there because they're looking to work on their startup, then we might connect them to someone who, you know, has a startup idea or he has venture funding or something like that. And then, you know, 12 months later, if it, work, if it doesn't work out, maybe we can work with them as a developer, you know. The, the point is it's all, it's mainly about relationship building and not necessarily direct sales. Sure. Because all the partners that I can think of, you know, we didn't, none of the partners that we have, did we get by just approaching them and saying, can you be our partner? It was more through like knowing this person for a few weeks or a few months, understanding what they do, understanding what challenges they're running into, and then finding something that can fit. A lot of times it wasn't us that filled that need. It was us referring to someone who's, you know, this guy's an expert at social media or this guy, you know, he's an expert at coaching. You know, you want to train your pitch. But once you're known as a sort of connector in the industry, which, I, you know, I can't take the credit for that. It's mainly my partner that's uh, Vlad, who's a good job, who's doing a good job at that. But once we had all those connections in place uh, and grew our group, we could really leverage that. Yeah, and, I, and that's a, I would say a vital thing to do is being an influence in your in your local neighborhood or your community. Um, you know, we've you've I've done hangouts and stuff like that, and or not hangouts, but uh, meetups. meetups. Yeah, you've been great at that. But you know, the fundamental premise is you got to give to get. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But when I had found, even though you know those things were up in the air, like I'd have three people show up one time, and then I'd have. 20 show up the next, you know, you never know you, you've been to a few right. of those and you never know how many people are going to show up, but you know, to this day, I still get contacted from the people that did go to those meetups uh, for work and stuff. So, right. Yeah. I've had people contact me from presentations I've given from like five years ago. That's yeah. good. So I think it's great, but I think what Hike is, is talking about is, you know, the meetups that you and I've done have been kind of industry specific. Right. Hike is kind of taking it one step further and doing meetups for business owners where mm -hmm. he may not have a personal stake in it. Right. initially in that and he's doing a great job of doing some matchmaking and some relationship building mm -hmm. hike you've got a, yeah exactly a, an interesting topic that you talk about that i was fascinated when i first saw it and it's about trying to protect the work that you do particularly from an organic search standpoint and it, mm -hmm. it seemed to me that it was about hey let's make sure the client benefits from the work that we do when we're doing it but if they leave us they shouldn't benefit from the work that we do and I think you call it Switchbox SEO. Am I describing that right? Yeah, yeah, correct. So th this isn't something that I invented myself. It's mainly something that I, I learned from uh, different websites on the internet. Um, and I can speak to the concept for sure. Essentially, it's the idea that when you're doing things like writing content or building links in order to improve rankings, uh, you are trying to do those on websites and properties that you own rather than directly on the client's site. Um, with the big picture perspective that, you know, the client is ultimately interested in getting more business and getting more sales, whether their website ranks or not is sort of a second order. Uh, it's definitely important based on how you position your sale, but ultimately what's gonna make them really happy is if they have a lot of business. Um, and so there's pros and cons to that. Um, just for some uh, clarity, we don't currently use that model, but it's one that we're seriously considering and you know i've seen some good case studies for it so I, that's why i did a kind of deep dive to see how it works essentially it's let's say if you're thinking about building a link to a client's website you would instead build it to a domain that you own and then redirect that to the client's page or let's say you're thinking about writing a blog you would put it on a website that you own and then link to the client um, the idea is that you're sending all the power their way but you still have the option to change all those links out um, if they decide to stop being a client. Oh, I see. Okay. It's an interesting perspective. I've never yeah. thought so of it that way. 
there's, there's definitely there's definitely pros and cons. So the the big pro the big con that I see that is the main reason we don't use it has to do with how we present our services from a sales perspective, where we pitch our service as a project to get the client to the first page, not as a ongoing service just for doing SEO. And the idea there is, we'll tell you, you know, it might take X months or X years, but at that point, you know, that's your website, that's your asset. We're building an asset rather than marketing or advertising. That's the distinction I make. Um, so again, there's pros and cons. If you think it's going to be a long-term client, um, you know, maybe one way is better versus if you think that they might churn out or they're not really going to stick around to begin with, you might try the other approach. Per my personal feeling on it is it's kind of more ethical to work on their site if you're promising that they're building an asset versus if you're pitching it like advertising and it's all clear what's going on, um, then I'm sure doing Switchbox is fine. But even in that case, I would position it more like, you know, they're renting your site versus you're ranking their website. I, I would say that gives them an, uh, to stay on as a client, you know, <laughs> right. It's about managing expectations though, just yeah. making sure that they know what's, what's mm -hmm. in it in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. All the, all the problems I've ever had with clients had to do with unaligned expectations or like expectations not set correctly either. We didn't communicate clearly about what we were going to do or what results they were going to get, or, you know, they didn't clearly communicate what they expected. Um, you know, we said one thing, but they expected something more, that kind of thing. So getting yeah. on the same page at the beginning before you do any work Amen. is very important. Yeah. I would have to say that is probably number one, if you want to keep them at long term, because if they're not on the same page, you know, they're not going to last. Yeah. I was talking to my team about, you know, don't trip over pebbles. Cause it's not the technology that's usually going to let you down. It's not going to be some creative failure. That's going to sever the relationship. Yeah. It's going to be a communication issue. It's going to be some mismatched expectations mm -hmm. that Hike talked about. So that's where we focus on is making sure that there's an open dialogue and an open expectation. You, yeah. you can't over communicate mm -hmm. in a service-based business. And it's probably best to over. <laughs> right. <laughs> Michelle, you had a question. Yeah, I do. So we're talking about obviously building up long-term relationships, kind of letting that relationship be the driver of new business. But I know as an independent consultant, sometimes you don't have the time to let a relationship mature. Something happen. Maybe as as an independent, you can very frequently find yourself in a situation where all of a sudden a client's like, look, I got to make a change. I, I'm out of budget or this or that. And all of a sudden work you thought you were going to have just went away and you're like, how do I replace that right now? Um, it also happens more often as a flow with agencies. So we've got a, a good group of people all working on several clients that are really happy, but we just kind of hit a plateau where that growth that we saw a year or two ago isn't quite happening the same way because it, you know, there's a lot of things about this business that are cyclical and you will hit periods where it slows down, it picks up, it slows down, it picks up. What do you do in those periods where it seems to be slowing down or you need to pick up something quick and you really don't have time for a relationship to mature and turn into business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that that's when there's two things that we, we would do in that situation that I would do in that situation. One thing I would do is um, think about what type of criteria you have for taking clients. So for example, one of the criteria we have is we, we have a certain budget where if the client isn't at least at this budget, we don't really want to bring them on. Um, that's one example is reducing your minimums. The other And the reason why that's relevant is because then if you have those other relationships with agencies and things like that, you'll oftentimes run into agencies like ourselves included where you'll say, you know, hey, what's your minimum for clients? All right, well, if you have somebody below that, can you send this to, can you send them to us? And vice versa, if you're in that moment, I would position it as, you know, hey, I know XYZ is your minimum. Have you gotten any leads in the last 30 days that you just couldn't close because they didn't fit your model? Um, that's that's a simple thing I would say. The other thing is pretty unappealing to most people, but it's pretty, it's like hard sales. Like you pick up the phone, you start dialing um, qualified prospects. So examples would be if you find people that don't have their Google business page claimed, 
or their Yelp page claimed, you know, just doing some clever searches on a Google search to identify potential prospects. Um, you know, you could go ahead and just dial every business on a search result page, but if you're cold calling, um, you want to have at least some filters up front to make sure you're talking to people that could close. Um, I can't, you know, doing it hard outbound like that is really the only way I found to pick up sales in a snap um, where these relationships and things like content marketing, ranking your own websites, those are all, I would say, medium to long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would add too that specializing is critical yeah. because it always sounds good when people come to us, uh, you know, listeners of the show and say, well, and we'll, we'll say, well, who do you handle? What kind of clients do you want? And they'll say, well, I work with anybody. And to me, that's the most dangerous answer to give on that. You really have to establish some key verticals that you're going to specialize in because when that day comes, when you need that business, as you talked about, Michelle, you don't want to go, who should I call? You want to go, what businesses in this vertical do I call? And you want to be able to leverage the success like Hikes did with his other clients and say, you know, we worked for client A in your vertical, had massive success, want to be able to do the same things for you. That's an argument that resonates as opposed to hoping for the best that if you get through to somebody on the phone and say, listen, I'm a digital shop and I can, I can do this. The more you specialize, the more you get yourself in a niche, the less frustrating, the less anxious sales and business development comes. Establish a niche. Certainly. What would your advice Certainly. be? I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just about to say, I, I'd like to chase that rabbit down the hole a little bit more because that's, that's one of the, the big things within our agency lately is do we position ourselves based on the services that we offer or do we really get down deep in a niche and work that niche as hard as we can. And the more I look at what we're doing internally, the more I feel like um, chasing that niche, that vertical really is the way to go because there is just so much um, talking about a particular service. I mean, there's just so much content around just SEO that we really need more. Yeah, I'd like to hear Hike's opinion, opinion on it. But to me, if you're just selling the service, you're one of 100,000. If you're selling expertise within a particular industry, then you're one of two or three. Yeah. And so right away, that narrows down the qualification scale for you, and it makes it an easier pitch on that. Credibility goes up faster. Your messaging develops faster. Your case studies develop faster. And it's, it's much less frustrating on the business development standpoint when we say, hey, guys, have we contacted every uh, medical spa in these four states, as opposed to going to your business development people and say, hey, go find a new client. It's very frustrating from a, for a business development standpoint to just find somebody. But finding somebody within a closed box, much easier. Hike, what's your experience? Yeah, so there's a couple different things I can say for that. One is it definitely streamlines things from every part of your operation. So from a sales perspective, you know, I can tell you when I was pitching recruiting services to real estate agents and I still have the script stuck in my head. It's like, you know, are you looking for new agents? Can I speak to the guy in charge of hiring? You know, like you just get into a system and into a rhythm with a, with a vertical that you can't really replicate having to think on your feet and come up with creative conversations. Um, and it comes out, it comes out in the conversations too. If you know the niche, if you know the industry, you know, you're going to say, if you're talking to a dentist, you're going to say patients, you're not going to say clients, right? you know the language and you're more relatable on the call and on the operations perspective um you know if your content team is familiar with the niche if your link building team is familiar with the resources online that they should reach out to you know let's say you're working with restaurants and you have relationships with the top 20 food blogs well you know if you want to continue doing restaurant clients now you don't have to spend time doing outreach you can work on the same relationships versus if you add a new niche well now you need to do outreach for you know, blah for construction or mm -hmm. some other industry. Um, definitely streamlines things for sure. I think the only downside I could think of or the only reason I wouldn't do it is in two situations. One is if you're starting out, like you're brand new, I would position myself as, you know, I am the SEO expert in this town. Like I can work with any business, but you know, you want me because I'm local to you. You can give me a call. You know, I'll, I'll come to your business to say hi occasionally. Right. You have that value prop that a bigger agency just doesn't really have because it's not scalable. Mm -hmm. um, and the other end of the spectrum I've seen is on like the high ultimate high, high end um, where, you know, the company, 
like you go to their website, it seems like they do everything and their clients are like Ford and Pepsi and something crazy like that. If you're talking to a, like a company like, you know, a really huge company will just expect you to do everything because they don't want to manage more vendors. Um, so that's really the two perspectives there is if you're trying to tackle enterprise, um, I haven't, you know, the positioning that I found is you position yourself as a overall expert and for your fulfillment, partnerships are really key. If you're not great at social media, make sure that you have a social media consultant who you can contract out to that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, for the bottom line, if you're just, I mean, what would your advice be if you're someone like yourself that just started out and, you know, you, you kind of have to offer several different types of services because you can't just say, like you said, SEO is not really that scalable unless it's, you know, you, you, you can offer other services like development, website development. Uh, you, you mm-hmm. can, yourself could probably do a mobile app. I mean, <laughs> you know, right. Um, yeah, for sure. I think when you're starting out, like your first 10 clients, I would say beggars can't be choosers, right? You know, take whatever business comes your way and figure out a way to make it work. And then that's when you can look back and say, you know, Hey, the two, the two medical clinics we worked with, we did a great job with them. We knocked it out of the park. Let's find more people like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember being told a long time ago that some of the toughest decisions you make when you're growing your agency is is who to take on as a client. Sure. And I thought, really? Because it's anybody to me who has a checkbook with a check that'll clear. But uh, it has really come to be true. Not everybody's a good fit. Yeah. And being able to determine which client's going to help your agency grow is a is a decision that's a lot harder than it looks on the surface level. Yeah. And I think at any level, it's really hard to turn business away. <laughs> it is, but sometimes you have to. Exactly. Yeah. And who, who, you know, we've all have people in our life that are negative energy versus positive energy and clients are the same way. Clients oh, yeah. can sometimes bring negative value and they bring positive value. Yeah. And being able to detect that is a, is a cornerstone decision that you have to make when you're growing your agency. Yeah. But I mean, I, when I started out consulting, I mean, I started out small. But as the client had a need, you know, I made myself learn those things that I right. didn't know and, and eventually got into a, a level to where, you know, you can cover all that stuff. But right. um, eventually, hopefully, you get to a point where you start hiring more people and, and building it up that way. Yeah. But, in fact, let's talk about that. Hike, you've got some great combined experience with your work in uh, recruitment. You know, what, what, what it's the secrets to getting, surrounding yourself with good people? How have you made sure that your agency grows and grows with competent people. Do you have any secrets you can share with our audience about finding the right people to grow with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So there's a couple strategic things I can talk about a little high level, and then I'll give you some specific tactical examples. So at a strategic level, you know, I think with SEO, what you're really looking for is not necessarily someone who can tell you they have three years of SEO experience on the resume. You're really looking for someone who can learn quickly and, can act on their feet and you're just looking for more qualitative skills. Like, are they trustworthy? Can they act on their feet? Um, hiring for knowledge is really tricky. Um, especially when you don't have the knowledge that you're hiring for it, it's the most dangerous thing that I found. Um, so I, I try to look for mainly, can this person learn what I want to teach them if they don't already know it? Um, and are they a good person to work with in like in general? Um, I'm not looking necessarily for the person that's the best at what they do. Um, I'm looking mainly for, are they at least decent at what they do or could they learn what they need to know? And are they good at learning? Um, that's really the biggest thing I found with SEOs since things change so often um, and you need them to be able to keep up. If you throw something new their way, you know, next month, are they going to be able to keep up the pace or are things going to fall apart? So that's kind of strategic. What I think about um, hiring your friends is a thing that I hear a lot. You know, definitely if you have friends that you think could learn quickly, um, that are trustworthy, that's the best place to start because you don't, you don't have to waste time doing job postings and calling people and doing interviews. You just ask them, you know, do you think you could do this? You know, rely on your experience with the person to help with that and then figure out something that makes sense. Um, but to get a little more tactical, because this is kind of hand wavy, some specific things that help me a lot are in your, um, in your job postings and in your, in your, any kind of recruiting that you do, there should be some basic filters that um, someone who's paying attention and on top of their game will figure it out, but aren't necessarily time consuming. So for example, whenever I do um, job postings for freelancers, I always put in the job posting that, you know, to get an interview with me, here's what you have to do. 
add me on Skype and include this keyword in your message. And it's like, that's as simple as it gets. My goal number one is just to get with outsourcers. My goal is to get them on a Skype interview to see if we can communicate because that tends to be the biggest barrier. You know, their profile can look great, but if they can't work with our team, um, it's just going to be too challenging. So sure. I like to include that little speed bump because anyone who's reading it, you know, it takes five seconds to do, but anybody that's mass applying to job postings, they're just going to miss it and you can safely ignore them. Yeah. Um, I, that, that's a quick tactical tip uh, right there. We have to take a break. We'll be right back. Search Talk Live is sponsored by the Robert Palmer family of companies. Check out robertpalmercompanies.com for more information. Find the true value of your home when you log on. Homevalue.com Get your questions in on Twitter. Type hashtag Search Talk Live and your question. Now back to the show. All right, Hike. So, I mean, it's, do you are your people remote or are they in-house? So the, the people that I have in the U.S., they're all in-house. Some mm -hmm. of them, you know, they might work remote on a day or the week. Mm -hmm. But anybody, anybody else that we have that's outsourced is overseas uh, for sure. Gotcha. So, I mean, it's got to, there's got to be a, a real good vetting process with, at least with me anyway. And I'm sure with you, when it comes to like something like SEO, you really got to be careful on who you're hiring. Um, mm -hmm. What, what is your process there? I mean, you look yeah, at for sure. The, the best I, advice I could give for that is I would try to hire someone who doesn't actually know anything about SEO, but they, can learn quickly and they're easy to communicate with. Um, and the, the two advantages there are one with SEO, it's so easy to make, to learn a lot of bad habits. Right. And when you're hiring someone who has SEO all over their profile, um, you can be pretty confident they're going to carry those with them. And um, number two, when you're hiring someone who's new, because this is kind of along the same lines, someone who's new to freelancing and new to Upwork and all those websites, mm -hmm. they tend to be more affordable. Like you'll get rates that you didn't believe that you could actually get. Yeah. Um, but as long as you do that vetting to make sure, you know, can they actually learn it if I spend the time to train them? Um, are they, can they speak English well enough that everyone on my team can understand? Um, then you'll have a good hire on your hands. Like you'll tell people, you know, I have this person working for me at X dollars an hour. They won't believe you because it's absurd. <laughs> Yeah, two dollars, something like that. Well, it's good because I think for the folks listening to the show, we've talked about growing your agency. What key is partnerships, right? Because you're going to get a volume of business that is either above or below your capacity, mm -hmm. as Michelle is experiencing on that. So you've got to have people to turn to on that to handle that extra workflow. You got to be using partnerships to develop your business, yep. and you've got to use uh, partnerships to grow your business on that. And you've got to have some system for vetting out the people who you're going to bring into your circle. But I think we all panic, right? You know, that, that time when it comes, we need it, and then all of a sudden we panic it, and we, we hire under duress or we take a client under duress, and that rarely works out well. So if things are going well for you right now, yeah. it sounds like the key is to put together your plan. You know, how would you vet out an SEO person? How would you vet out a PPC person? Where would you go to find an SEO person and put that plan in place? You know, and Americans are not really good at planning for emergencies. We tend to react at the last minute. So this is kind of like having a fire plan when you're a kid that Smokey the Bear would say, you know, make sure you have a fire plan <laughs> for growing your agency. You kind of have to have that plan in place yeah. before you need it, because if if you wait till you need it, you're going to do it under duress and you're probably not going to make the best decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree. Um, I think having the partnerships is, is really key because um, I could imagine, you know, let's say if tomorrow we got so many more clients that we couldn't handle. There's two or three people off the top of my head that I know that I could refer them business. We would get a percentage on the referral and they would execute with flying colors on the client. Nice. Um, and, and vice versa. I know that, you know, we have a couple people that we're connected to. They're doing their own projects. They're getting really successful and they're looking for people to offload some of their agency clients. Um, that, that's just where I think the value of networking is, is because, you know, if you're helping out your group, if you're giving, then when time comes to ask, you're going to surround yourself with people that are also willing to give. Yeah. And I think you've talked about in the early part of the show, recognizing where you are kind of in the food chain, right? So if there's a bigger agency that uh, gets leads that, that they are too small for them, make sure you know who those agencies yeah. are. And then at some point mm -hmm. you're going to be that person where 
there's a lead that comes in and it's not big enough for you. And then you want to be able to pass that person down because who knows where that lead's going to grow to someday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Right. Relationships. Yeah, the, the, lead, yeah, the lead could come back to you when the freelancer outgrows them. The freelancer could become your next employee, right? Their business could grow and they could start referring you business. Um, one, one of the things that I started recognizing internally about myself, whenever I get that feeling like, you know, I want to keep this, I want to feel greedy, you know, I want to do things that are best for me. That's when I, I realized like, no, I need to take a step back. I need to give a little more than I'm comfortable giving. I, and ultimately it's going to do more for me than the, you know, the dollar here or the lead here um, in the long term. That's a good attitude to have. <laughs> So what it now back to when you're outsourcing, is there, I wanted to touch on this for the listeners. Mm -hmm. Do you have some kind of quality control or uh, process? So when someone's doing, let's say SEO, especially when you're, you've got somebody that's new, um, mm -hmm. what is your, your, your process there? Sure. So I think it really begins with, with the training. So a uh, tip that I could give everyone who's, thinking about bringing people on is your training needs to be so like more as simple as you can make it in terms of, you know, using simple language, speaking slowly. Um, in our cases, we record a lot of training videos. So I'll, I'll use a, like a Chrome extension or screen recorder mm -hmm. to show how to do a process. Right. And make sure that it's super unambiguous that if somebody who cared half as much as you did this same process, the output would be at least as good. Yeah. That's, that's a key thing key thing that, it, that, you know, I didn't really know until I started hiring people is, you know, your employees, your um, subordinates, your contractors, they're never going to care as much as you do about your business. So you have to set things up so that, you know, their success is more inevitable, where if they do one through five and they were supposed to do one through 10, you still get the outcome that you're looking for. Because mm -hmm. um, it's kind of inevitable that, you know, life will happen to them and, you know, when there's an emergency or, you know, let's say a hurricane, you're not their biggest priority. Um, and you need to be prepared for that. Yep. Michelle, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, since we're talking about how to hire, I wanted to kind of loop that into when to hire. So there have been a lot of discussions in several circles that I'm a part of about growth rate. Because obviously we all as marketers see a lot of news about how fast the digital marketing industry at large is growing. And I, I've run into instances where the expectation of growth isn't realistic. And I just wanted um, to find out where should we be kind of pointing ourselves as far as rate of growth? what factors determine how fast should we as opposed to how fast can we? Interesting. That's a really interesting question. So one of the things, you know, I always, I always think about is um, in terms of growth, I want to grow as quickly as possible because, you know, the example I gave is if I get, you know, 200 leads tomorrow that all want to work with me, as long as I have partners that can fulfill those needs and I can refer it out, um, you know, A, I'm going to have as much business as I can handle and B, I'm going to have a bunch of partners that love me. So too much growth. I, I never really think about too much growth, but in terms of, well, okay, how do you actually handle growth and what are good targets? Um, my sort of workflow and our trajectory was to start with having, we started with three partners. So it was me, uh, I was on the operations side. Um, we had a more technical person who under, who did a lot of SEO R&D and a third person who was more involved in sales. So we started by doing everything ourselves. Um, me and one of the partners were doing all the fulfillment, uh, and then the other two partners were doing all the sales and closing. Um, as we grew, the, the first thing that we decided was we want to keep adding clients until we're too busy, um, until we kind of we borderline just can't keep up where we can say hey you know if you added one more person uh, we probably we might drop the ball um and that that's pretty that's a pretty good line um, i would say the process that worked for us really well was starting with the first person that you bring on shouldn't be an employee it should be either an overseas contractor a virtual assistant or uh, an outsourcing agency which is really 
tough. I, I still haven't found a good outsourcing agency, but at least one that can do the basics that you need them to do. Um, in my opinion, it's more of a temporary thing where you're between being able to have an employee and uh, needing someone to help you fulfill. It's kind of an awkward moment where you're, at least in our end, like our delivery, our results fell um, until we could actually bring everyone else in-house and do all the key stuff um, or do all the direction making, all the decision making and guidance and strategy in-house. Gotcha. You have a question? I think, Hike, you're also dabbling in a pretty exciting form of marketing, influencer marketing which a lot of people are kind of on the fence about. Tell us about your efforts so far in influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that really turned me on to influencer marketing is the concept. Um, this is something that one of the, I would say sort of marketing leaders, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about is marketing is about mainly about attention. And so if you want to show up, if you want people to see your product or service, you need to be, where they're looking, right? Where their attention is. With Google, it's pretty pretty intuitive. If someone is typing in, you know, real estate in Seattle, you know what they're looking for because they typed it in. You know where their attention is. It's on that search search result page. Um, but if you think about where people spend most of their day, their attention is spent in a lot of different places. So social media has been one of the biggest growth channels and one of the best time sinks for, you know, I think the average person spends at least a couple of minutes on Facebook a day, probably more than a dozen. Um, and so as a business owner and as a marketer, you need to be where people are looking um, if you're looking for high volume. So example would be um, Facebook was a good example because that came up and people that were buying shout outs and sponsored posts on pages did a great job. Uh, Facebook realized what was going on and they introduced their advertising system. So now if you want to show up, you have to, it's kind of pay to play. On a lot of the newer social media channels, if you think about things like Snapchat, Instagram, uh, even live streaming platforms, um, it's less uh, figured out essentially, meaning that the platform holder hasn't figured out how to monetize it as, um, as to sort of coax out any amateurs. So if it's, same thing with Google, if you think about it, you, you kind of have to know what you're doing to rank on Google. Um, so that most people turn to AdWords when they don't really know what they're doing. Same thing with Facebook. Um, you can't just post a message and expect 100 people to see it. They ferret you. They kind of funnel you to the advertising. But some of these newer platforms, their advertising system is not really developed. And the best way to reach people is to connect directly with account holders and influencers who have a lot of followers. Um, and in my example, what... Uh, Matt was talking about, I'm doing some research and development with live streamers. So if you think about websites like Twitch and websites like YouTube where people stream themselves in real time, um, I've checked out some of those sites and they're not, there, there isn't really any, ad, the advertising that's there is kind of token advertising, kind of like you would see banners on a website. Um, it's not really compelling. And I've, I've been doing some tests with those guys promoting products that have been turning out pretty well. Um, it's the same concept if you think about early days on Snapchat or Instagram where there wasn't really ads, there weren't really any ads. And so whenever you saw your favorite you know, person that you're following promote a product, it was kind of rare. You're not being overloaded like you might be on Facebook or Google nowadays with yeah. advertising. So it totally worked. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've dabbled with that a little bit too. I mean, like um, I, I recently opened an e-commerce store and they uh, – you know, you know, let's say Kylie Jenner, she's got a million followers and she took a photo with a particular neck necklace and you went and found that necklace and started selling it on your website. Then you could start creating influence like that. I mean, this, I mean there's just a ton, a ton of different ways you could do that. But, um, and you only knew that cause you're a Kylie Jenner follower. Is that correct? No, no, I'm just an example. <laughs> <laughs> He's only her best follower. <laughs> yes, big fan. No. But I think as it relates to influencer marketing and growing an, an agency, I think you kind of have the same um, same issue here because think about who businesses trust when it comes to growing their business. They trust their accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be a business strategist or consultant that they trust. And sometimes there's an IT person in their life that they trust. Yeah. 
And when they looked for guidance, they turned to their IT person, they turned to their accounting person. And I would say, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this hike, that influencer marketing for growing your agency may be tapping into that network of accounting folks, business strategists slash consultants. And for us, uh, we've had some success with IT people Mm -hmm. because when IT people, businesses lean on their IT people, they go to them in times of crisis. So when they have something that they perceive as a technical need, which to them, a website is a technical need, it's not a marketing need. They go to them and they say, well, gee, we need to do this. Who do you think we should do this? And that to have that relationship there. What's your sense like of that as a tactic of influencer marketing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the, the challenge, the main challenge that I see there is when people are on, you know, when people are just looking at Kylie Jenner on Twitter, they're not really thinking about their business initially. So you're getting a wide net, you're getting pretty much anybody, I don't know how many millions of followers she has, but you know, that's a solid fraction of the entire population. Uh, and vice versa, you know, how, how many times a day do you think someone might speak to their IT person? Definitely their advice is going to be more trusted, but I would consider that more referral and um, network marketing, right? Mm-hmm. You need to know their IT person personally right. so that they yep. can vouch for you and you need to have that trust and credibility built up. Um, at the same time, if you think about how influencer marketing works, it's mainly B2C and that tends to work because your your sale price is going to be lower. You're not talking about a thousand or 2000 or 3000 or more a month. It's like a $10 knife or yeah. $20 pair of shoes. Uh, and it's, it's less of an ask on the influencer to promote a particular product um, than it is to, you know, if you ask Kylie Jenner to talk about SEO, um, I don't know how compelling that would be for her audience. <laughs> right? uh, I'm sure you could get some sales from it just because, you know, out of 30 million people or however many, there's got to be business owners that are looking to grow their business. But I think you get the idea. Yeah. You know, we, we're, you mentioned the um, word price, and one of the notes I have to ask you about is uh, about mm-hmm. pricing your services. I think it, the topic that I see the most oh, on the question. boards yeah. uh, about people who are trying to grow their agencies and have their own shops is about how do I price my services? What have you experimented with, Hike, and what, are, what model have you landed on now? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question because our, our pricing system has totally evolved from when we started to where we are today. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that you could do to kickstart kickstart that and really make sure you understand what's going on is talking to other people in your niche so talking to other people that have seo agencies people that have marketing agencies uh, getting a feel for what they're charging and what your local competitors are charging do you Um, do you tend to lean more towards a contract pricing or maybe uh an hourly rate i mean do you know what i'm saying retainer yeah yeah Yeah, good question so since the beginning of when we started our company We've been doing uh, contracts for monthly services. Um, I would say about halfway through uh, our development, we switched to, it was still a contract pricing. It was based on number of pages or number of keywords that we're working on. Mm -hmm. And actually recently, since we brought on team members, we're switching gears into more of an hourly retainer type model Mm -hmm. where we have, you're going to get 10 hours a month um, if you want more it's pretty clear, you know, you just pay more. Right. Um, it's kind but of this is block. how much we need to drive measurable progress. Sure. Sure. I've just seen so many, especially in the software industry where they, they've done contract pricing and they end up burning themselves because they've spent way too many hours on what they originally estimated. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. other thing that comes in play with the contract pricing is, you know, is the tail wagging the dog. If the client comes to you and says, Hey, we want these three things done, mm-hmm. but they're not the things that are most actionable or productive to get them results. Right then the time for renewal and they look at you and say, well, we didn't really get the results that we were looking for. Yeah. Well, that's because I did all the things that you wanted me to do and I didn't do the things that I thought you should do. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. You know, I want to speak to that too, because we ran into the same thing and that's part of why we came up with our hourly solution is our, basically the way that we structure our deals is a certain number of hours, let's say three to four to five are for what we call holistic SEO, which is essentially just on our end, you know, what are the things that we can do that are most likely to actually get them results? Yeah. Um, as opposed to, you know, whatever random stuff oh. that they really care about. Cause there's always like the guy that wants every picture of his menu item on Google business. Okay. Well, I mean, that could help, but it's going to take a lot of hours. I don't know how quickly it's going to help you, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So you go after the low hanging fruit first. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, Because ultimately, like he said, you know, they're going to talk to you about the results six months down the line, 12 months down the line, even if they've been asking you to do, you know, some kind of nonsense in the meantime, that doesn't really do much. Absolutely. Well, and I I like this discussion because it also helps with the breakup process because you're going to find somewhere along the way that either the client isn't a good fit for you or the client finds that you're not you're no longer a good fit for them their business model changed or or any number of things and being tied to a client because our contract is six months nine months 12 months long makes that breakup process really hard when you know go for the benefit of the agency and the client that should be a parting of the way should be easy okay now we uh it's that time of the show where we do what is called the believe it or leave it. Now right. We, go ahead, you explain. Hike, we have found three statements on the internet, and of course we all know mm-hmm. if it's on the internet, it's gotta be true, right? And we're gonna right. get you to react to them and tell our audience if they should believe it or if they should leave it. You ready? All right, let's do it. Okay, here's number one. By the end of 2018, people will no longer use the term digital agency because all agency work will be primarily digital. Oh, leave it for sure. Don't believe don't, that. Don't, don't believe that. No, not at all. <laughs> ah, there was a guy writing a really interesting post about that the term digital agency will disappear from our lexicon. Really? You know, I, I thought that too until about a year ago, but if you've worked with any marketing consultants, anybody working at large, like any 60, you know, I, I'm younger, so I'll be frank up front. You know, I've worked with some older people in the industry, and when they talk about marketing, they'll say things like electronic marketing. You know, when I heard that, <laughs> I'm like, like, what do you mean electronic? <laughs> like, right? But that means TV and radio. You know, that means TV and radio. Traditional, yeah. from their perspective, is newspapers, print advertising, right? So it's a generational thing, in my perspective. You know, with millennials and some of the younger people. Every type of advertising is digital advertising. They don't think about necessarily a, even a sign on a store as marketing or advertising. Yeah, um, yeah I would. Uh, I always thought that was going to happen with SEO. I thought SEO would change to something else. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. yeah. it just doesn't. It's not the same. Right. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Back to question number two. Like most of the digital mediums, a pay for performance model will soon dominate agency pricing methodology. Uh, yeah, don't believe it. <laughs> you say don't believe it? Yeah, don't believe it. Okay. So leave that. I, I one. doubt that. Yeah, leave it. I don't think that I don't think that pay for performance will ever really dominate. No. Um, maybe not for ten or twenty years because there's so many types of marketing that are highly popular that will continue to be popular, which are not directly connected to performance or the analytics or tracking just isn't there. So examples would be things like, um, you know, if I ask you, do you think billboards will stop existing in the next 20 years? And if you say no, well, no one's paying for performance on a billboard. You know, traditional advertising, as long as it exists, um, will continue to be traditional, you know, with the traditional model. I don't think that unless technology gets really so advanced with attribution that you could really do pay for performance yeah. um, and that it would make sense for people that have those properties. Yeah. In SEO, you, a lot of businesses go out to business. You know, they go, right, out, they of go out of business. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Number three, Facebook will launch a program in 2018 that certifies agencies in their digital ad buying competence. I could believe it. I haven't read anything about it, but I could see something like that. I'd like to see something like that. Yeah, it they're seems definitely... like they've got the op- opportunity too, yeah. right? I mean, they, they're they lacking a certification a la Google, and it there seems like there's a, a void there for somebody to step into. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know it'll never happen, but I'd love to see Google do something like that for right. SEOs or, or yeah. you, you know. Well, they, oh, yeah. I mean, well, they have it for AdWords, but yeah. they're never going to do it for SEO. Right. Yeah. yeah. That'll yeah. never happen. Yeah, I think they're going to stick to their Google partner certification and try to make that their yeah. good mm-hmm. housekeeping seal of approval. That's a safe, that's a you know safe bet. It's not. You know, but I would say <laughs> going back to the second one, and, and I know we're running out of time here, but if Google has its way, 
I'm not unconvinced that all media outlets will feel a pressure for pay per- performance pricing. If they continue to do the, the lead driven activity now in local search that's showing up in, you know, locksmiths and HVAC and, and some of the service vendors where that's on a cost per lead basis mm-hmm. on that. Let's, let's say that that grows and, and explodes and that's now available for restaurant reservations. And all of a sudden, two years from now, we look around and Google's got a cost per lead scenario in almost every sector. Hard for businesses not to turn to other media outlets and say, well, I can either put my money with you and I don't know where it's going or I could do this Google thing and I am paying for performance. It'll create some pressure for other media outlets. And a class action lawsuit. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely agree that I could do that happening, but if you look at the economics of it, I don't think that will, yeah. I don't think they would do it for two reasons. The first reason I don't think they would do it is they make too much money on people that don't know what they're doing with AdWords Yeah. Um, that, are, that aren't getting any results. So number one, if they want to pay for, for, for pay per performance, they would be showing a lot of ads and driving a lot of clicks that, didn't turn in anything. It's the opportunity cost to them. Uh, the second reason I don't think that they would do it is if you think about supply and demand, at least in every marketing channel that I've seen, people that do marketing sort of on autopilot um, tend to lose money. Um, uh, any, you know, If I think about Google advertising, uh, Facebook advertising, if you just follow their workflows and set up an ad, um, you won't really be profitable. So even if it's paid for pay for performance, if I'm selling a $20 pair of shoes, you know, I could see the, um, I could see the cost per conversion if that's how they charge going to $20 for a $20 pair of shoes because the savvy business owners who know how to drive repeat customers will drive out anyone who's, you know, anyone who's trying to enter the market. When you look at that, you're like $20 for, you know, am I going to pay $20 a click or $20 a conversion to sell a $15 pair of shoes? You know, that's out of, you know, you're out of your mind and you see the same thing with some industries where the CPCs are, you know, anywhere up to a hundred dollars. Um, I think insurance is a common one, right? But I, I bet that the guy who's doing those insurance ads consistently year over year, he has a funnel that can actually make those profitable. So yeah, well, the barrier to entry is just going to go up for conversions in my perspective. I, I agree. Definitely. Uh, we are out of time. <laughs> we could keep talking on forever, I imagine. But um, I want to thank you, Hike, for being on the show. It's been a, a great uh, eye opener for our listeners, and uh, hopefully, mm-hmm. gave them some actionable items. But uh, we have time for the tattoo. What do we got? Three minutes. We do. We've got a short time for a tattoo. Hike, what's your best, most concise, most impactful piece of counsel you would leave our listeners with that Robert can get put on as a t- t- tattoo? <laughs> Well, the first thing I thought of is um, is relevance and authority. Whenever I teach people how to do SEO or how does Google work, you know, I can always go back to that and you know, sort of cement it in their head with that. If I had a tattoo on my shoulder, every time I did a talk, I'd you know, pull that up my sleeve and show them, okay, this is all you need to know about Google, relevance and authority. And I'll teach you what they mean. That's a good one. And Robert, I would say about three out of our last seven guests have used the word relevance yeah. in answering that question. Uh, yeah. It's telling you something. <laughs> yep. There's a trend. <laughs> yeah. So w- if people want to reach you or can they reach you on Twitter? Well, tell us about your, what's your website address, all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the best way to reach me is via direct email or phone call. So, or text message, I guess. So my email is H A Y K at logic And my phone number is two zero six eight eight three seven two two six. So feel free to text me. Feel free to email me or, you know, give me a call if we arrange something. I don't take out of area code numbers. Um, just going to get so much telemarketing, but text messaging should be good. Okay. All right. So uh, that's that'll do for our show today. Guys, tune in next week. We have another guest. Our guest next week is uh, not written down, so I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tune in next Tuesday, 3.30 to uh, 4.30, we'll Eastern Standard Time. Matt. You'll be with us next week? We'll be with next week. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. Michelle. Weather permitting. Awesome. Glad you could join us. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you next week, guys. Thanks for your support. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Search Talk Live is sponsored by the Robert Palmer family of companies. 
Find the true value of your home when you log on. HomeValue.com If you have questions for Search Talk Live or you're interested in being a guest or a sponsor of the show, email Robert at SearchTalkLive.com. That's SearchTalkLive.com. 